welcome. I'm Tom Strong, president and CEO of CanBIM and principal at Wired Dock Construction. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today is a very important day. Uh, we're going to be releasing our annual publication. This document really supports our mission as an organization. As you know, CanBIM's purpose is to drive technology and innovation to advance our civilization. We think this is really important. You know, our industry does not operate at 100% capacity. And we need to improve, frankly. You know, if, if you think about the cost per square foot to realize new affordable housing, to build bridges, to build the infrastructure that our society needs, and you look at the opportunity that, that is possible for us to improve, we've got a long way to go. And I think that the individuals that participate in our organization, our members, I think we're all really focused on improving our organizations and improving the way that we collaborate and we engage with each other to realize the built environment across Canada. So we think it's extremely important. And the mission of the publication is to highlight this innovation. This is the fifth time we've published this document. Every year, it's, it's amazing to me to see the amazing things that are happening across the country. And this year is no different. And I'm very proud of the fact that SQE, who is a major procurement en entity in Quebec, is changing the industry. They won the, uh, the top innovation award this year the, uh, for our awards program, uh, and they're featured on the publication cover. And SQE is, is really driving standards and technology from a government, government perspective in the, in the Qu uh, Quebec market and helping the industry to evolve there. And it's having a real meaningful change on the industry. And I believe that the other provinces can really learn from this. So um, you know, if you have the opportunity and you're connected with someone uh, in, in a provincial level, hand them this publication, if you can get a copy of it in their hands and say, look at what's happening in Quebec. It's amazing. And they're driving change in their industry. And the result of this is going to be better quality housing, better infrastructure, and a better environment that uh, we all occupy, and ultimately a better civilization. So uh, very proud of the fact that we highlight these things at CanBIM. I think this, uh, the Innovation Spotlight's a very important initiative. Uh, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, it's very expensive and time consuming to pull off, but we're proud to do it. I want to thank our sponsors that make this possible. When you get your publication, when you order it from our, our website or check it out on our website, uh, go to the center, uh, the center of the document first, the centerfold, and check out all the sponsors that contribute to make this happen. Uh, these are the organizations that really value uh, moving our industry forward and support these kinds of initiatives. So Thank you so much to our sponsors for doing that. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things before we get into the interviews with some of the contributors to the publication. Some of our upcoming events uh, on May 14th, we're having a Feature Friday featuring BIM One, Canadian company that helps helps companies interface with BIM and, and, uh, and technology. So May 14th, check that out. Uh, May 28th, SolidCAD, who's a, another company focused on uh, helping companies use technology. Uh, going to be featuring some really interesting uh, case studies from their clients. Uh, if you want to get involved with our organization to help drive our mission forward, if you want to contribute towards shaping the publication and our events and our direction and our strategic plan, get involved with the think tanks. Uh, you can go on our website and check that out. Uh, the think tanks are groups of individuals that are focused on innovation and technology for their organization. And they're, they're focused on different areas where we have challenges. And they work together on a monthly basis to kind of re-envision the means and methods, the technologies, and try to try to introduce innovations in the market and publish that out to make meaningful change uh, across the industry. So if that appeals to you, if you want to work with uh, people that are extremely knowledgeable in this space and build some long-term relationships, get involved with the think tanks. I highly recommend it. It's, it's a great way to uh, contribute uh, towards improving the industry. Uh, as you know, the cover of the publication always features the top innovation award, which is the uh, uh, the whole purpose of this document, really. Uh, and if you want to be on the cover of the, of the publication, well, you got to submit an award. Awards are open. The award submissions are open right now. They close July 31st. So uh, if you are, I'm sure you're all scrambling to get your team to think about this, but I know that you're all working on some really cool cutting edge stuff within your organizations. Take the time and, and uh, make a submission to the awards program. Uh, it's a really fun event. We had over 6,000 uh, people uh, view the awards event last year, and uh, it, it really puts your organization and the work that you're doing up on a podium, 
and, and you can be recognized across the industry. It's great for your brand. It's great for your career. It's great for your team for morale. So definitely check that out. July 31st is the deadline. Uh, certification program. So as you know, we have a, a program at uh, Canbim. We're trying to recognize industry professionals that are focused on driving the BIM process and the digital project delivery process over the life cycle of projects so that all of these industry professionals are speaking the same language and understand how their organization interfaces with other organizations so that we can move this, uh, this digital transformation, the use of digital technologies uh, for construction and design and facilities management uh, forward in the industry. So the certification recognizes these individuals and benchmarks, uh, benchmarks their capability it's a great way to advance your career. It's a great way to highlight the capability of your organization. Uh, so definitely check out the certification program. The next deadlines is limited space, certainly. So pay attention to that. But the next deadlines to get uh, your applications in for your team or for yourself is April 15th and July 15th. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in. And again, thanks to our sponsors. Uh, and we're going to have a, uh, an interview here with Sarah Lipset, who is the individual that uh, helps to drive the creation of this, this document for us every year. Hi, we're here with Sarah Lipset, who's our editor and director of our annual publication. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, maybe just for people that don't know you, if you could just uh, explain really quickly uh, your background and how you uh, started working with us on, the, on this project. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, currently, I'm an intern architect at a really great firm getting my hours for license. Um, that's my career, main career focus. But before I went to school or even knew what an architect did, I wanted to be an editor who published art books. And so during my undergrad degree at Ryerson, I was actually their editor and creative director for the school's architectural journal. And that just exponentially grew my interest in bookmaking. And so in grad school, I started working with CanBIM to develop and inaugurate their annual publication. And it's been an extremely rewarding five years working with the hundreds of collaborators and contributors who have been involved. So this is our fifth issue together and I'm looking forward to many more. Awesome. So tell us about this year's publication. Uh, what, what were the, like, the major influences on the, contact, on, on the content this year? Well, I think it goes without saying that COVID-19 made this year especially poignant and memorable. But of course, with the 2021 issue, we're not talking about the virus itself, but rather we're interested in the affect that has on the Canadian building and infrastructure landscape. What that reaction was to such a tumultuous time, how our members and contributors have created so many opportunities of the many ongoing challenges and really carved out spaces to advance the economy and the industry. So what was the theme of the publication and why is it important? Well, this year, we, our theme was uh, the future of work. Uh, what that means to move forward, recognizing what contingency measures we need in place for work of all kinds at all stages and how to continue um, and be resilient even you know, when we're disrupted by a global event like this. Um, I think it's important because you know, this, this sort of global shakeup what force our hand in an incredibly optimistic way. We've learned how to be resilient, learn what wasn't working, adapt to new changes, tools at lightning speed. And despite the constant gray zone of not knowing what's going to come next, I think it's an important ideology to maintain. You know, we're an industry of constant evolution and innovation and being comfortable isn't necessarily a good space. Yeah, no, I think that, uh... That kind of summarizes what, what people will gain by by reading the document. I just think it's a wonderful document. You do a really fantastic job every year. It's it's always really it's a really beautiful thing that you put together, and I'm excited to share it with people. Uh, from your perspective, uh, interviewing all these people from across the con the community of Canbim, what were the common challenges, uh, technologies, innovations? Uh, like what technologies, innovations are people focused on over the next twelve months? I think that the biggest challenge may not be the technologies themselves, but what we're deciding to do with all of the data we've collected from these technologies. How do we transform all this knowledge that we have into projects, better tools, better processes um, that can result in more sustainable practices, more informed decisions, uh, increased job site safety, streamlined processes, and you know, essentially better built buildings. Yeah, right on. So this is a huge undertaking for you. I know you work 
pretty much the, all 12 months on this, collecting information, chasing people to respond, uh, editing the content, pulling it together, working, you know, ch bouncing it off the board for input. Um, it's a huge undertaking and we really appreciate it. You do a wonderful job. If someone's interested in participating in next year's uh, magazine, uh, can they reach out to you? How do they get involved and, and like, what's that process look like? Absolutely. You can absolutely reach out to me um, at innovation spotlight at canbim.com. Otherwise, we always put out a call for submissions in late spring that lasts from about late April till, till early September. And that's usually the window. And I just want to say that it's a, you know, as from Canbim, it's an extremely um, proud project to be a part of, but it wouldn't be anything without the many contributors. And we should really be thanking them for all of the hard work that they put into the issue as well. Yeah, right on. Uh, thank you so much. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And I uh, hope to be talking to you next year about next year's publication. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Yep. Thanks again, Sarah, for your contribution to create the publication. And I'm so excited to introduce and actually show off your work. As I mentioned before, we do this every year. It really helps us to benchmark innovation and technology use across the Canadian market. This year, we chose the theme of the future of work. Obviously, the pandemic has impacted the way we work across the industry. I would like to say that it's actually accelerated a lot of the trends that were already taking place. We're seeing Deep demand for the use of BIM, setting up common data environments across active teams to help collaborate and work uh, remotely. All these technologies are really supporting our work, and I think it's having a deep effect on the future of how we will collaborate and the future of how risk is managed on projects. So that's where we decided to focus with this year's publication. We looked at it from four different categories, technology, education, advocacy, and implementation. So throughout the document, we have a number of different case studies and, and interviews with industry professionals that are facing this problem. And we're trying to re-envision the future of the industry and how we'll be working. So the process to create the Innovation Spotlight is really a, a year-round effort, as we mentioned. Throughout the year, we're procuring materials, we're interviewing people, we're collecting case studies. Sarah's organizing and editing this information, uh, working across our membership. She pulls together the imagery and the graphics and actually does the layout for the document. And then we go into final reviews and editing, and then we obviously print and distribute the documents. So it really is an enormous effort, and Sarah does a wonderful job. And uh, you know, obviously everyone that contributes works really hard to pull this together, and it's it's a great way to highlight what you're working on as a, as a business, and it really is a great way that uh, we highlight our award winners and activities across our membership. This document is designed to be printed, and we do print a limited number of copies, and it is available, so if you wanna order a copy, just go check out our website. I think they're beautiful. I love to put them in uh, waiting rooms like a coffee table book. We get traction all over the world reading about these, these stories and examples of innovation in our market. So you know, go to our website at the end of the broadcast and check out the, uh, the online edition. And of course, share it with your friends and colleagues. Thank you so much to all the contributors who were interviewed or contributed case studies and shared knowledge with the industry. Appreciate this so much. I understand it is a huge amount of work, but so excited about the outcome. And thanks again to Sarah, who's the, our editor-in-chief, and Maxim Legay, who did the French translation. I also want to thank our partners and sponsors that make this possible. We have a number of sponsors annually that support this document, but we also have people and companies that uh, su supported this effort directly. So thank you so much to all of our members and partners and sponsors that helped to, uh, to bring this document to life. And if you're interested in getting involved with the Innovation Spotlight for 2022 or helping to theme it or contribute in any way, reach out to Sarah at innovationspotlight at cambim.com. Without further ado, this is the Innovation Spotlight 2021. SQE, who is the winner of the Best in Innovation Spotlight Award for 2021, is featured on the cover. This is the Vendril Solange Hospital, a $1.7 billion, 404 bed medical facility in Quebec. A fantastic project that's due to open in 2026. It's an example of one of the major projects at SQE is orchestrated the use of new technologies on such as BIM and integrated project delivery. Really fantastic to be able to feature this project on the cover. And I just love the way that Sarah wraps the, the rendering of the project and the 3D modeling around the front and back of the cover. I think it's a, a beautiful design. Just some, some examples of some of the layout and graphic work that she did featuring the case studies and stories from around the industry. It really does a wonderful job of taking advantage of the 
really interesting imagery that's generated from all the computer systems that we use. It's a real creative art laying out these documents and I think she always does a really wonderful job. Excited to share that with you so go check out the website and review the document yourself and if you're interested again in getting a physical copy of this go online and order a copy and and share it. So thank you so much for tuning in uh, to check out the publication and we're now going to interview some of the contributors to the Innovation Spotlight starting with SQE. Now we're going to be speaking to SQE, which is the Society Quebecois des Infrastructures. Uh, they won the Best in Innovation Award. They also won the Development Asset Management and Lifecycle Award. And they're on the cover of this year's uh, Innovation Spotlight publication. Uh, we're going to be speaking to Guy um, Paquin, who is the Director General of Strategies and Special Projects. Uh, Guy is an engineer. He's been working in the Quebec market for over 40 years in the public and private sectors. He's been instrumental in driving innovation and new technologies across SQE. We're also going to be speaking to Steve Tremblay, uh, who is the Director of Development and Integrated BIM PCI Practices, uh, which basically covers integrated design processes. And he uh, he has uh, 20 years experience and manages a large team that works across SQE. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, guys. And um, I'm really excited to have a chat with you. Bonjour, ben, merci de l'invitation. C'est un plaisir pour nous d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. So how has the pandemic affected how you think about space management? Uh, or, do you think these are going to be temporary changes or do you think that it's going to have a lasting effect on the, the, the shape, the size, the configuration of the new infrastructure that, uh, that you're creating uh, and introducing into your portfolio? Merci. Question très pertinente. Effectivement, euh, il est certain que l'occupation des espaces, la gestion des espaces sera différente avec euh, l'arrivée de la pandémie. Bien sûr, c'était euh, euh, un moment très difficile pour le Québec. Le Québec a été durement touché, euh, mais il faut voir du positif dans chaque chose et la, la pandémie aura permis euh, de faire cette réflexion au niveau de l'occupation des espaces. Euh, les milieux de travail. Donc, la SQI était déjà, même avant la pandémie, impliquée dans une réflexion au niveau du gouvernement en tant qu'expert immobilier sur comment euh, faire une, une transition au niveau des milieux de travail, les rendre euh, plus flexibles, plus performants, revoir la façon d'occuper les espaces. Donc, la pandémie aura accéléré cette réflexion. Euh, la SQI est activement impliquée à travers ce, ce travail. Bien sûr, le, le positif dans tout ça, c'est que le, le, la transition numérique sert de levier à cette transition ou à ce changement au niveau de l'occupation des espaces. C'est très important pour nous. Euh, un bel exemple, c'est que du jour au lendemain, à partir du confinement, à partir du début de la pandémie, la SQI a été en mesure de, 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 de faire une transition au niveau du télétravail euh, à travers les, 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 les plateformes, les, les outils numériques qui étaient mis en place. Donc, c'est un avantage pour nous. Euh, nous savons maintenant que le télétravail est là pour demeurer, est là pour rester. L'important, c'est d'appuyer cette transition avec justement une bonne transition numérique, mettre en place les bons outils, les bons moyens de communication pour permettre aux gens, peu importe qu'ils soient à l'intérieur des, des locaux ou euh, en télétravail, de pouvoir accéder à l'information, euh, aux moyens de production, aux moyens de travail, de pouvoir travailler et d'être dans la continuité du service, peu importe d'où euh, nous travaillons. Bien sûr, au niveau de la gestion des, des espaces, la SQI est là pour appuyer les ministères, les clients, les organismes au niveau de la fonction publique québécoise pour justement réfléchir à comment les nouveaux espaces de travail devraient être aménagés pour bien soutenir cette transition numérique et cette, on pourrait dire, cette nouvelle normalité qui nous attend après la pandémie. So how do you think technology is affecting the construction industry? Do you think technology is going to, for example, uh, allow us to overcome uh, labor shortages? Merci de la question. Euh, assurément que la technologie va permettre de surmonter ces défis de pénurie de main d'œuvre. Euh, on sait tous que euh, la, la transformation numérique 
amène des nouvelles façons de faire, bien sûr, mais va permettre aussi d'attirer des personnes différentes dans l'industrie de la construction. Et à preuve, le plan d'action sur la construction a été dévoilé au Québec par Mme Sonia Lebel dimanche, euh, il y a dix jours, inclut beaucoup de mesures concernant euh, la, la, concernant la main d'œuvre dans le secteur de la construction, mais inclut aussi une, une, une affirmation claire du gouvernement que la construction doit prendre le virage numérique. Alors, ce virage numérique euh, permettra justement de d'attirer dans la construction, dans le secteur de la construction, des, des jeunes, comme par exemple, on sait très bien que les jeunes aiment beaucoup les jeux vidéo. Donc, il y a beaucoup de, de similitudes avec euh, l'utilisation du numérique dans la construction, avec le BIM et les, euh, les représentations euh, numériques de, de la chose, euh, permettra aussi d'attirer euh, des personnes euh, qui ont peut-être des, des handicaps, des personnes euh, qui, traditionnellement, l'industrie de la construction n'attirait pas, euh, par exemple, au niveau des, des femmes qui sont, euh, euh, vont, vont pouvoir euh, accéder à plusieurs euh, domaines de la construction, justement, par l'implication avec le numérique. Donc, effectivement, il y aura une grande, euh, un grand impact mais euh, ce plan-là, de, 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 ce plan d'action dans la construction euh, est, est un lancement et nous en sommes au, au début de, de cette transformation-là. Là. Bien que la SQI a entamé les choses il y a, euh, il y a quelques années. So SQE has really been pushing the market to change culturally uh, by introducing new technologies, uh, you know, BIM for collaboration. Uh, what's been the re reaction from the market? Has there been pushback uh, or, you know, has there been a gradual shift in, in how, how everyone's reacting? Uh, and how do you decide how to set that pace of change? La SQI, comme je le mentionnais tout à l'heure, a débuté son, je dirais, son positionnement au niveau du BIM il y a plusieurs années, déjà en 2016. À ce moment-là, on était dans l'exploration et euh, personne ne souhaitait se lancer comme donneur d'ouvrage parce que euh, l'industrie de la construction n'était pas là. Et euh, c'est comme la peau et l'œuf, l'industrie de la construction ne souhaitait pas se lancer parce que les donneurs d'ouvrage n'étaient pas là. Alors, euh, ça, ça a été fait. On a lancé. Puis par la suite, on a quand même euh, eu des relations très, très, très étroites avec l'industrie de la construction. Et puis, pour écouter l'industrie de la construction, on a notamment, euh, avec le ministère de l'Économie et de l'Innovation, lancé un chantier en 2017 pour euh, le déploiement du BIM au Québec. Et puis, on a entendu les, les, les participants, 300 participants représentants de l'industrie de la construction, qui sont venus nous dire, euh, oui, on souhaite euh, du changement, on souhaite euh, davantage de collaboration dans les projets, on souhaite euh, embarquer euh, dans cette transformation numérique, mais d'une façon euh, progressive et graduelle. Alors, ces termes-là qui sont euh, euh, redondants, qui peuvent paraître redondants, on les utilise euh, tout le temps, nous, depuis des années, euh, progressif et graduel. Donc, euh, dernièrement, je mentionnais à, tout à l'heure à, à la question précédente, le plan d'action sur la construction incluait une feuille de route et inclut toujours une feuille de route dont la SQI est le principal porteur avec le ministère des Transports du Québec. Cette feuille de route du déploiement du BIM euh, s'étendra sur cinq ans. Nous sommes à l'élaborer et puis il y aura dans une première vague plusieurs autres grands donneurs d'ouvrage qui se joindront à nous. Et euh, je peux, d'ici quelques semaines, malheureusement, euh, j'aurais aimé faire l'entrevue dans quelques semaines pour vous dévoiler le nom de ces grands donneurs d'ouvrage publics euh, au Québec. Mais c'est un signal clair du changement, du rythme de transformation que devra adopter l'industrie de la construction. Donc, euh, dans cette feuille de route-là, nous continuerons d'utiliser toujours euh, les vocables euh, progressifs et, et graduels chacun des grands donneurs d'ouvrages publics concernés euh, ira à sa vitesse, 
mais euh, le signal sera clair du côté euh, des donneurs d'ouvrages publics euh, au Québec. Alors, c'est un rythme qui sera ajusté, toujours être à l'écoute de l'industrie, euh, s'assurer de l'évolution de la maturité et d'aller à la vitesse de l'évolution de cette maturité-là. So SQI has announced that BIM will be used on all projects over $50 million in value starting in April 2021 and on all projects over $5 million in uh, 2023. How have you prepared the market for this shift? And um, how do you measure success? Um, and what have been the results that you've seen so far? Excellent. Um, ben, comme le disait Guy tout à l'heure, euh, le projet de déploiement corporatif de l'ASQI s'est amorcé il y a déjà plusieurs années. Et dès le départ, comme on le mentionnait, on a toujours été à l'écoute de l'industrie et en communication constante avec l'industrie. Donc, ce, cette préparation-là de l'industrie et ces jalons-là qui sont importants pour nous, les nouvelles cibles actualisées, euh, comme tu le mentionnais à propos des 50 millions et plus à partir du, du 1er avril de cette année et 5 millions et plus à partir de 2023, sont très importants pour nous. Nous considérons que l'industrie est prête à aller de l'avant et d'accélérer de, de, cette transformation-là, notamment parce que, justement, nous, nous gérons le changement avec eux. Nous sommes en collaboration constante avec l'industrie et en discussion constante avec l'industrie. Donc, les acteurs, euh, de par la réponse au niveau des projets, euh, de par l'augmentation euh, naturelle du nombre de projets qui sont réalisés à l'ASQI, démontrent clairement qu'on est prêt à aller de l'avant. Donc, ce, cette communication-là, ces échanges-là vont se poursuivre parce que nous souhaitons également euh, accélérer, mais aussi élargir l'utilisation du BIM dans le cadre des projets. Donc, le niveau d'usage, les, les, les usages autorisés, l'utilisation du, du plein bénéfice et de toutes les dimensions du BIM euh, va aussi venir avec ces, ces nouvelles cibles-là. Donc, c'est très important pour nous. Donc, la discussion doit continuer, doit se poursuivre avec l'industrie et c'est ce que nous souhaitons faire. Pour ce qui est de la mesure maintenant, euh, au niveau du succès, ben, comme je le disais il y a quelques instants, le nombre de projets, l'accélération, la gestion du portefeuille de, de projets que nous avons à l'ESQI est un gage de succès, démontre le succès du déploiement de l'ESQI. Euh, l'accélération de la réalisation des projets euh, est un autre exemple. Bien sûr, nous souhaitons mettre en place et nous avons des indicateurs de performance au niveau du quantitatif. Nous souhaitons chiffrer les bénéfices mais on, euh, nous savons très bien que ce n'est pas simple à faire. Les projets de l'ASQI sont des projets de longue haleine. Donc, nous souhaitons mettre en place des indicateurs. Nous observons euh, les projets. Nous savons aussi que c'est difficile euh, d'isoler les facteurs qui peuvent influencer la réalisation d'un projet et les, les chiffres d'un projet. Mais on, on se penche aussi, c'est important de le faire, sur des indicateurs qualitatifs. Euh, ce que nous observons concrètement dans le cadre des projets, Notamment, un bel exemple de ça est un des projets majeurs réalisés par la, la, la SQI actuellement sur un chantier, malgré les conditions de pandémie, malgré le, la, la, les conditions COVID qui, qui ont touché les chantiers. Euh, on recevait des témoignages au sein de, de l'équipe de professionnels, donc les ingénieurs, euh, les architectes impliqués sur le, le suivi des travaux, ainsi que les entrepreneurs qui mentionnaient que malgré les conditions, les ralentissements euh, et les, les contraintes au niveau de la pandémie, n'avaient observé au sein des entrepreneurs aucun retard euh, lié à, à ces contraintes-là, dû notamment, et c'était de, 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 de leur témoignage, euh, à la qualité des maquettes, le fait d'avoir mis les maquettes au centre, d'avoir assuré la constructibilité du projet en amont et d'avoir bien planifié en tant qu'équipe de projet euh, la réalisation des travaux. Donc ça, ce sont aussi des bénéfices concrets qu'on qu observe. Donc, le succès aussi euh, peut, peut se voir à travers ces, ces exemples-là. So, what do you think the federal government should be doing to support your work in Quebec? And what do you think they could be doing in other regions in Canada? Ici, on ne peut scinder, à mon avis, les projets qui émanent du fédéral versus les projets qui émanent du provincial, du gouvernement provincial. Euh, les professionnels qui sont impliqués dans les projets au Québec euh, et les entrepreneurs qui sont impliqués euh, dans ces mêmes projets euh, sont les, les mêmes 
dans un type de, 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 de projet, peu importe le donneur d'ouvrage, euh, dans un, un projet du gouvernement provincial, un, un projet du gouvernement fédéral. Donc, euh, il faut, à mon avis, euh, annoncer clairement les choses, faire preuve de leadership. La feuille de route, bim, annoncée par le gouvernement du Québec il y a une semaine, euh, donne clairement l'alignement et la vision du gouvernement du Québec euh, à l'industrie de la construction au Québec. Il y a plusieurs entrepreneurs qui viennent faire de, de, de l'extérieur du Québec, qui viennent aussi faire des projets au Québec. On le voit dans plusieurs grands projets. La SQI, dans son portefeuille de projets, a plusieurs projets de, de 500 millions, 600 millions, 1 milliard, 2 milliards, 3 milliards. Alors, euh, le, il y a plusieurs entrepreneurs euh, qui viennent faire des projets au Québec. Donc, il faut voir, je pense, le, le, le Canada et le gouvernement fédéral comme euh, un, un grand tout avec les diverses juridictions. Et puis, euh, à titre de juridiction qui, qui vient toucher l'ensemble des provinces, je crois que, au même titre que le gouvernement du Québec, qui fait office de leader parmi les juridictions au Canada, euh, le gouvernement fédéral se doit de, de lancer clairement son opinion par rapport au, au déploiement du BIM, qui, à mon avis, est un grand bénéfice pour la construction. D'ailleurs, il s'agit de penser à des grands travaux qui sont faits par le gouvernement fédéral au niveau de la, de la, de la colline parlementaire à Ottawa. Donc, euh, le, le BIM ou, ou le BIM est, est, est utilisé en large part dans les travaux complexes de rénovation. Donc, euh, au niveau gouvernemental, je crois que nous devons euh, aller euh, clairement annoncer cette vision-là, comme le fait le, le, la SQI il y a quelques années, comme le fait maintenant le gouvernement du Québec. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, and thanks again for contributing to the publication, and congratulations on winning the two awards and being on the cover. And uh, we're all really excited to watch the impact that your initiatives are going to be having on the Quebec market. Uh, so thanks again. Really appreciate it. Merci. Merci, Tom. Ben, J'en profiterai peut-être justement pour euh, dire que pour nous, la, la, la couverture d'être sur la page couverture de la revue, euh, c'est la touche finale à une belle expérience au niveau de la candidature, au niveau des prix remportés en novembre dernier. Euh, c'est une fierté pour nous à la SQI. Euh, le projet que nous avons choisi est un projet fort pour la SQI qui est en cours actuellement et qui démontre euh, de l'innovation sur plusieurs aspects. Euh, je salue d'ailleurs la vision euh, offerte par le, le, la direction du projet qui a choisi vraiment d'aller clairement vers l'innovation en déployant le BIM et d'autres approches euh, intégrées de la SQI dans le cadre du projet. Euh, C'est aussi grâce à la synergie, à la collaboration qui existe au sein de l'équipe euh, qui a permis de, de, de mettre en place un tel projet. Donc, c'est très important pour nous et on voulait le démontrer à travers la, la, la page couverture. Euh, nous sommes très reconnaissants de, de, de la place que CanBIM offre à la SQI actuellement. C'est une belle reconnaissance du travail accompli. Euh, J'en profiterai d'ailleurs pour saluer l'équipe du déploiement euh, des, des pratiques intégrées de la SQI, que je remercie pour, pour le, le travail, pour toute la, la, la passion démontrée. Je remercie également la, la, la haute direction de la SQ qui croit toujours et qui a cru dès le départ au projet et qui croit toujours en, envers le potentiel qu'offrent les pratiques intégrées déployées par la SQ. C'est très important pour nous. Euh, je salue également tous les acteurs de l'industrie qui sont impliqués de près ou de loin dans cette transformation. Euh, de, de, de croire, de, de vouloir embarquer avec la SQ dans cette transformation, c'est très important pour nous. Euh, ce ce, ce n'est pas un choix exclusif de la SQI et vous le voyez à travers aussi l'annonce de la feuille de route gouvernementale que c'est un jalon important, une belle reconnaissance pour l'industrie québécoise de la construction qui, qui est là présentement. Et finalement, je voudrais remercier bien sûr Tom et toute l'équipe de, de CanBIM pour le travail que vous accomplissez. C'est très intéressant, vous, êtes, vous faites un très bon travail au niveau de la promotion de l'innovation au niveau canadien et c'est toujours très agréable de discuter avec vous. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Canbim. Et puis, on peut compter sur des organisations comme vous là, pour euh, s'asseoir solidement, là, pour euh, aller plus loin. Alors, merci beaucoup, Canbim.
Thank you so much, Stephen Gee. Really appreciate hearing what uh, what you're doing there in Quebec. I think you're really uh, setting an example for the rest of the country uh, around how you're integrating BIM and new technologies into procurement. I think it's a great strategy, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in that market as a result. Uh, next, we're going to be talking to Roddy Handa. Roddy is an architect. He's a lawyer. He's one of the founders at Hollow Block Architecture in Alberta. He's a really interesting guy. He's an expert in integrated project delivery. He's contributed multiple times to our publication this year. He's also working on our uh, project delivery and risk management think tank. Uh, so really enjoyed the conversation with Roddy. Okay, well, I'm here with uh, Roddy Handa, who is uh, one of the problem solvers at Hollow Block. Um, I guess uh, you're also the founder, but you guys all go by uh, problem solvers, correct? Yeah, we're not real fans of titles over at Hollow Block, so we try to keep it simple. Yeah, cool. Progressive. Um, so you contributed in a couple of different ways to the publication. Uh, one, you were interviewed uh, for the the uh, the one the piece on uh, integrated project delivery, uh, which kind of covered that uh, subject pretty thoroughly. And I mean, you you have a background. You're an arch architect. You're also a lawyer. So pretty interesting. Um, Pretty interesting conversation you had there, as and you also authored collaboration with Progressive Procurement. Uh, pretty interesting article. So I just have a, a couple of different questions. Just want to kind of uh, throw at you here. Uh, so you mentioned that the industry is in a fragmented state, and that's creating challenges improving productivity and introducing innovative solutions. Uh, can you elaborate on this? Uh, what do you think are the key strategic elements that executives should be focused on? Uh, to help move their organization forward and introduce new innovations. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that we, we still do things the way we've always done them. And design and construction is a largely bureaucratic institution. We have a lot of paperwork. We push it around just to make sure that, uh, you know, we cover our, our liability and we pass on liability to the greatest extent that we can. So when you have more progressive procurement models where you have either a waiver of liability or you, you're all in the same pot, uh, and you share that risk and reward component, it's amazing how much of that waste you can strip out of the process. And with a lot of that waste, we, we tend to silo our work because we're concerned about people relying on incomplete data or incomplete uh, work product. Uh, and again, when you're, when you're in this, this whole scenario together and you're not worried about pointing fingers, you have the ability to share that work product. And when you share that work product, you have the ability to leverage all the expertise in the room to progress that work product and I think that's what starts to break down that fragmentation. Uh, yeah. Once we're all in the room and we can all discuss solutions to problems together and not just rely on past proven solutions, that's where you'll start to see some more innovation in this industry. And I think once you see that innovation, that's where everybody starts to win. Owners get better products for their, their money. Uh, consultants start to make some money uh, and contractors become more yeah. profitable as well, which is I think what we're all in this industry for. So from like an executive standpoint, you know, if you're an organization that's never been involved with an IP, IPD project, uh, or maybe you're not, uh, your organization doesn't have that level of expertise around using technology for coordination and whatnot. Um, what do you think, you know, how, do, how, where do you start, you know, strategically to help your organization move forward? Yeah, what, what should you invest in? Who should you hire? There's a lot of good resources out there. And, and I think, uh, you know, lawyers sometimes get a bad name. Uh, we're the butt end of a lot of good jokes, but uh, lawyers are really good at what they do. You just need to properly explain the problem to them. Uh, if you give them a really simple problem, they'll give you a really simple solution that just eliminates your liability. Uh, and that's not what we need. We need a bit more creative uh, thinking when we're entering our contracts, when we're discussing things like copyright, so that we can look at what's the objective that we're trying to achieve here. How can we achieve that by still safeguarding those interests that we want to safeguard? Uh, but how do we also push the industry forward? So executives can invest in good, you know, internal counsel or external counsel. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I think just attending different uh, sessions that Canvan starts to put on uh, around topics like intellectual property, just having that kind of uh, exposure to uh, the prevailing themes and the prevailing uh, words of wisdom in the industry can help executives implement those practices into their organizations. Yeah, right on. Uh, so regarding IPD contracts, and I, I like this a lot, you mentioned that uh, there's a real, it's an importance of accountability, attitude, and ability. Um, so from an owner's perspective, you know, when you're looking at the attributes of a team, 
and I think team is super important for IPD projects. How do you how do you measure when you're evaluating different teams if if a particular team, a consortium that comes forward um, to, to build your project, to bid on your work, has the right chemistry? And how do you measure that? How do you ensure that that there's a good formation of a team there that is not going to kind of default back to old lump sum behaviors and, and are ready to participate fully in the, in the IPD process? Yeah, I think that that risk is uh, actually very minimal in an IPD because if you if you go out and, and ask for a full team, there's two ways to, to form an IPD team that I've seen. There's come in as a full team or there's come in as your, your discipline and then the owner kind of cherry picks and puts a team together. I prefer the former approach because then I know who I'm getting in the boat with. Uh, and I know I'm not bringing anybody on my boat that's just going to sit there and be dead weight. I'm only bringing in people that are going to actually pick up an oar and and push the the boat forward. So uh, when you're when you're in that type of an environment, you're only going to get teams that can depend on who they're bringing forward because they know they're all in the same boat. Uh, where in a design bid build, everybody's in their own boat and they're just throwing water into somebody else's boat. Uh, right. in, in an IPD that's just not the reality because now my, uh, my success, my profit is tied to uh, the steel stud trade or it's tied to um, you know, the, the drywaller. Uh, and if, if that person is not dependable, then I'm, I'm in trouble, the whole team's in trouble. So yeah. from an owner's perspective, you wanna look at teams that have maybe done this before because IPD is a very different animal. You don't mm -hmm. wanna revert back to those old practices. Uh, but if you find a team that has, you know, one or two or dozens of these under their belt, you can be rest assured that they've, they, they've worked out a system that ensures that they're going to meet their profit. Uh, and if they meet their profit, it means to the owner that you've got a building on time, on budget, and, uh, you know, uh, achieving all the conditions of satisfaction that they've outlined. Do you, do you think that the IPD model will eventually be the dominant form of contract in Canada? Uh, and you know, if so, what are the impediments that exist right now that are, that are slowing this down from taking hold across all, all types of uh, procurement? Uh, I, I like to be an optimist. Um, so yeah, I, I think it will be um, the prevalent uh, model for procurement in the future. Uh, whether that's 20 years from now or 30 years from now, I can't really say. Uh, the biggest impediments right now, uh, I would say government's a really big impediment they tend to shy away from new procurement models and they tend to shy away from procurement models where there's a waiver of, um, of liability and you can't actually sue people. Yeah. Uh, government um, is always under the public eye and they need to be, um, be seen as, as protecting those public interests. Uh, and sometimes that perception I think gets in the way of, of reality because you, when, when you go that way and you, you kind of take the trust out of the process and you make it adversarial, you're actually not getting as much for your dollar as, as uh, as you would um, in a more collaborative procurement model. And I think once that becomes more understood and more uh, accepted, then you'll see governments start to adopt yeah. IPD um, as, as their main procurement model. But for now, that's the biggest impediment is, is it's, it's not really proven, it's still pretty new. Uh, although you're seeing a lot more private developers adopt it, um, that's gonna start trending up a lot quicker. I think the last people that will, will really embrace it would be governments. And until mm -hmm. they do, uh, we, a lot of the projects we're going to see right now are government projects. Uh, that's just the state of the economy. That's just the state of development right, right now. Um, and until so how do we solve that? I mean, I, it was you know hundreds of thousands of people are going to watch this video. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the call to action? How do we how do we prompt government to uh, to learn about these new contract models and and uh, adjust their their thinking? That's that's a really good question, Tom. I. Uh, I think you might have to run for either premier or prime minister. Um, it, you know, it, it's hard because a lot of politicians, they're not from this industry. They don't really understand it. Um, and to, to educate them, uh, they've got so much on their plate that they need to understand. Um, it, it's tough to really educate from the top down. So my hope is you'll get people that join government uh, that aren't elected officials that start to push this from the ground up. And they, yeah. if you get that, I think that's where you'll start to see um, that transition and maybe ministers starting to listen and saying, no, we need to get away from these other procurement models because look at the successes we've seen with some of these other, uh, yeah. other developers. Uh, I also think I, I'd applaud the Edmonton Public School Board because they receive public dollars uh, and they basically told Alberta Infrastructure, we'll take on that risk. And, uh, and the Alberta Infrastructure said, we'll take away your contingency. And uh, Edmonton Public School says, that's okay. That's how IPDs work. We'll figure it out. 
And uh, we were actually successful on some Edmonton public yeah. jobs, sending money back to Alberta infrastructure because they were IPV. So ironically- well, it was a great, uh, I, I really enjoyed the piece. I thought it was a really great example of the use of IPD. And I think that uh, the more people that read that article in this year's publication, the better. I mean, we can, we can use that as a vehicle to help to educate uh, uh, government procurement uh, individuals to, to help them understand this contract type. So thank you so much for that, uh, that contribution to the publication this year. And I really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll talk soon. I'm hopefully in person soon. Thanks for having me, Tom. All right, thanks. Well, thanks so much, Roddy, for taking the time to talk to us and thanks for the contribution to the publication. Always really excited to talk to you. Uh, I just think integrated project delivery is so important to our, our industry and it's a growing concern. So if anyone is interested in learning more on that, certainly reach out to Roddy. I'm sure that he'd love to talk to you. Uh, now we're gonna talk to James Hayes. James is the principal and founder of If Then Architecture. He's based in Ottawa. He's had a, uh, an extensive career focused on all sorts of technologies that uh, document buildings uh, using uh, LIDAR and photogrammetry. He's an expert in this space and uh, he contributed a really great article to our publication. Okay, well, I'm here with uh, James Hayes from If Then Architecture, which is a, a firm focused on reality capture, although we're gonna talk a little bit about that description of, of, of scanning and photogrammetry a little bit. I think uh, James has a better, a better way of describing that. Um, James has been working in the industry for a number of years. He's based in the Ottawa area. Uh, he contributed uh, to our publication with an article called Building Informed Fabrication Scanning for Authentic Documentation Design and Construction. James, thanks so much for uh, joining us and taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on what uh, If Then Architecture does and a little bit on your career. Sure. Uh, so If Then Architecture, we're a licensed architecture firm, uh, but our, pretty much our entire focus is on what we're calling digital building documentation. So going out in the field uh, with laser scanners, with photogrammetry, drones, um, and you know, capturing the, the details of buildings, whether that is uh, existing conditions uh, prior to a project or uh, the conditions on a construction site or greenfield conditions, you know, where a new building is going to go. Um, and then um, turning that data into something useful for, uh, you know, many project stakeholders from the architects and engineers, maybe up front to building owners that want to understand uh, how much space they have um, to, you know, sub trades and fabricators who need some accurate measurements uh, to build, to build whatever it is that they're going to build. Yeah. Just establishing the, the first principles before the design process starts. I just think it's so, it's so valuable to do that, especially when you're, you're dealing with exi an existing building. It's, it's really a no brainer to go out there and capture the building and bring that into the modeling environment. So it's accurate. That's so, um, how long have you been working uh, in building documentation technologies and uh, how did you first get exposed to, to it? So way back in uh, two, 2003, I, I moved to Ottawa to do my master's degree at Carleton at the School of Architecture there. Uh, and I met uh, a professor there. He's now at McGill, but uh, Professor Michael Jemtrude. He was the founder of uh, SIMS, which many people I'm sure at Canvim are familiar with, the Carleton mm -hmm. Immersive Media Studio. Yeah. Um, so even back in then, he was interested in uh, in uh, scanning, and we worked on a project. Uh, so I was a research assistant back then. We worked on a project in Ottawa for um, it, there was a convent on Rideau, the Rideau Street convent that was torn down, and there's a there's a, a specific chapel that was reconstructed, and it's still to this day inside the National Gallery. So it was a project about digitizing that chapel and then virtually reconstructing its context and combining all that kind of stuff. Then I moved on after that. And, uh, you know, it was always kind of in the back of my mind, that technology. I returned to Carleton uh, on a un uncompleted journey uh, on a PhD uh, back mm -hmm. in 2011. Um, and again, was uh, directly involved with SIMS with uh, Professor uh, Stephen Fye, again, yep. I'm sure you're familiar with. Very familiar and, with, yeah. uh, 
Yeah, and I uh, was involved with the robotic fabrication uh, at the Sims Lab and scanning and you know everything that they're doing. And then uh, in 2016, I started with Darcy Charlton and Ryan O'Dell. We started um, If Then Architecture. And um, I love the name, by the way. I think it's it's clever. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, now today it's just uh, Darcy and I as partners, Ryan has left the firm. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're kind of a smallish firm. We have uh, eight employees. And um, so, yeah, we, we, we've been involved in the center block. Uh, we do lots of uh, projects in Ottawa and we periodically come down to uh, Toronto to do some work as well. Yeah, great. So what do you what do you think this tech is important? And I know I, I called it reality capture, but I know you like to describe it as more like, uh, documentation technologies, which makes a lot more sense. But um, why do you think the technology is important? How is it changing the design process? And how is it being used to, to um, support detailing and fabrication? And yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, as you, as you alluded to at the beginning, um, and it, it is the vast majority of our work is basically scanning existing buildings um, and just getting a baseline of data, making sure all the stakeholders uh, have uh, all the information they need at the beginning of a project. Um, but, but, you know, just one of my personal kind of interests related to my PhD um, is the idea of, uh, of it helping with fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in general, construction, and again, um, you know, architects uh, have been kind of uh, obsessed and interested in pre prefabricated housing and all this stuff. And there's lots of, uh, um, you know, architectural literature on emulating the automobile and the uh, aerospace industry since Le Corbusier in the early 20th century. But I would qualify most of what happens in the AEC uh, on a construction site as a craft based, meaning something happens, there's feedback from what that, what that is, and then you adjust to, to, uh, to, to move forward. So it's more of like, it's less, most construction, and again, there is prefab and things like that happening, but most construction is more like a craft-based endeavor rather than a mass produce where in mass production, the idea, the correlation between the idea and the outcome is very, very tight. Like it's almost exactly, you know, the same thing. Like one, yeah. Uh, but in construction, as you're well aware, um, you know, once the construction starts, there's all kinds of changes. One trade builds something, another trade comes along and has to build on top of that. So my, my uh, you know, part of the reason I chose that kind of topic for the piece is I think it's something that isn't like, you know, I think pretty much people have a sense of laser scanning and photogrammetry and that kind of stuff at the beginning of a project to get that information, but it's not that well used or not that well known, um, you know, during construction, I, 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 would, uh, I would surmise. Mm -hmm. So, how, so do you, how do you, yeah, how's all this technology helping to, to make the industry more productive? Like, how are you, how do you think it ties into making those craft workers uh, more effective at, at what they're doing day to day? Yeah, so again, I think that it, uh, it, um, especially with, uh, again, with complex geometry, you mentioned uh, Frank, Ger Frank Gary earlier in our conversation at the AGO, but um, it, uh, it just takes the guesswork out of a lot of the measurement and it uh, provides a level of confidence, I think, um, for, uh, for the trades. And again, like when, you know, as a, when a trade is bidding on something, uh, bidding on work, if there's, the more unknowns there are, the more they're going to kind of inflate their price just because they don't yeah. know what you know what's going to happen on site. I know of trades, uh, you know, glazers, etc., that uh, plan on you know having to install something more than once. To, the first time yeah. they install it, it doesn't quite work, or there's going to be yeah. you know things happen. So I think that in general, uh, at, at the small scale, <clears throat> at the small scale, it just kind of provides a baseline level of confidence in the measurements. And it allows uh, trades to kind of fabricate something potentially offsite. I think concurrent fabrication, is, you know, compressing timelines, those things are valuable to construction. Um, and it allows those kinds of things to happen. So I thought, I mean, it was really insightful article. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, from an executive perspective, you know, if you want to invest in these technologies, if you want to utilize them in your day to day, I mean, if you're a 
don't know if you're a curtain wall uh, supplier, or you're a general contractor. How should you how should you think about uh, these new technologies? Where do you start? Where do you invest? Who do you hire? I mean, obviously hire an if then architecture for scanning. You know, but uh, well, if they want to, you know. Yeah. No. I, I, yeah. I mean, for our per just you know our strategy right now at the very beginning, we acquired a Leica P40, which we thought was you know kind of the best and most accurate. But what we quickly found out was that you know not everybody's interested in super uh, accurate information they will you know it might be more important to get more data and you know in the, in the the accuracy suffers a little bit so we we were trying as our personal kind of business is to you know cover all our bases we have slam we have terrestrial scanning we have drone we have a number of different terrestrial scanners but if you were in uh you know i think uh, your example a curtain wall installer you're going to want to get something that is going to be the obviously the most helpful to that work where you know so you might specifically want uh the P, something like a p40 a very accurate uh, scanner whereas if you're a general contractor and you're not maybe it's not your 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 work to be coordinating the trades work right. um but you you're using it to gather uh you know data on um on milestones of you know what materials have been installed on on the building you might be looking for something that's slam where you can quickly get in and around the building and uh, and just get a baseline set of data that way. So the accuracy maybe isn't as important yeah. to something like a So it's sort of working backwards from the problem you're trying to solve and trying to find the, the most appropriate solution that gives you, is a balance between cost and, and time, yeah. I guess. I mean, that's, uh, uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, uh, all this gear is a bit expensive. Um, and again, that's kind of where we're, we're trying to position ourselves. We have it all, so you can come hire us. So uh, what do you think the, I mean, in a real succinct way here is we're almost out of time, but what do you think the future of this technology is? Uh, how is it evolving? And how do you think it's impacting how uh, risk is managed on projects? Yeah, so I think the future for me, again, um, in I think the last your last uh, publication there you know there's and in the BIM world there's a lot of talk of uh, digital twins things like that and uh, the impact of BIM on future construction but for me I think the missing piece whether it's laser scanning or photogrammetry and what I think is going to happen is there's going to be more what I would call photogrammetric devices um, mm -hmm. like where we have a handheld scanner that right. does close range scanning it has two cameras on it um, and I think that that's going to be in the future where you're going to have a setup on a construction site with the construction site will have, you know, potentially hundreds of cameras and um, we'll be able to track things that way. But all that to say, the missing piece for me is if you have a digital twin, how do you reconcile what is built in? The, you still need to reconcile what is built and what is in the computer, what is in your BIM model. So, there, you know, I think we're making great strides in BIM, but then how do you connect that BIM to what is actually happening in the yeah, field. Yeah, bring that all, all that data. So that the issue is that you're gonna have so many sources of data, how do you gather it, correlate it, make it useful for basically making decisions and, and having an impact on your day-to-day -day work. That's right. Well, James, I really appreciate the time. Uh, I love the article, uh, recommend everybody read it and uh, good luck with the business in, in Ottawa. And um, well, I guess we'll talk soon. Okay, thanks, Tom. It was a all pleasure. right, take care. Bye. I am here with Sam Revel, who is the, um, I don't know what your title is, Sam. What's your title? Uh, Senior Prefabrication Manager. Senior Prefabrication Manager at Pitt Meadows Mechanical and Plumbing. Uh, Pitt Me Meadows is probably one of the most sophisticated mechanical firms in Canada, uh, based uh, out in BC, working on pretty much all the major projects out in that region. And um, Sam contributed uh, to the publication in a couple of different ways. One, you're featured uh, because you won uh, an award, um, I guess, in the, the uh, digital supply chain category. And you also contributed an article called Optimizing Stratus for Offsite uh, Fabrication, which kind of covers uh, the initiative that Pitt Meadows has underway to, to basically model everything that you're going to supply to a job site and build it offsite and then manage that um, the supply of that material uh, and, uh, and modules. So 
really sophisticated work. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, so what drove Pitt Meadows uh, to explore expanding its 3D detailing capability and establishing an offsite uh, prefabrication facility? Yeah, I think uh, overall the, the vision was driven, driven by our president, um, Steve Robinson. Um, so around about 2013, he was kind of just looking around at the market, becoming more and more frustrated with conventional construction and was looking for a way to kind of take the next leap as, as a company as Pitt Meadows. Um, he was really inspired by the, the offsite fabrication model that's so prevalent in Europe. Um, so he kind of jumped in, took a, a real chance, um, moved forward with getting ourselves some shop space, getting ourselves a BIM team and, and really starting to develop that. Um, so definitely kudos to him for having kind of a, a vision of, of where the industry was going early. Um, I joined the company in, in 2016. Uh, I'm from the UK, so obviously the, the prefab market there is quite prevalent. Um, it's definitely continued to thrive since then. Um, and since I joined, I've kind of worked as a PM and then also worked on our processes and then obviously became the, the prefabrication manager about three years ago now. Right. Um, and I've been working with the BIM and fabrication manager since then really to, to refine our process and make sure we're constantly improving how we model and how we, uh, how we fabricate. Um, it's definitely been an interesting growth period for us over the last three or four years. Um, when I joined, we were in a 7,000 square foot facility. We had one BIM modeler. Um, as I said to you, Tom, there, we're at 55,000 square feet now yeah, um, and eight full-time guys, as well as a, a full crew of, of what we call our fabrication teams. That's myself, fabrication manager, two fabrication coordinators, fabrication administrator, various welding supervisors and fabrication foremen who work in all of the different departments inside of the shop. Yeah, amazing. And obviously that growth, uh, uh, underlines the success that you've had with this new methodology. I mean, you're obviously winning work, you're being profitable and you're expanding. So um, it's obviously been a pretty successful initiative uh, for Pitt Meadows. So in addition to creating certainty and increasing margins, have you found that your modeling and modularization um, capabilities led to uh, winning more work? Are you, are you finding that you're competing less on price uh, versus being uh, invited to like negotiate because you have this uh, uh, advanced and specialized capability? Yeah, I think the simple answer uh, to that would be yes. Um, we've definitely been able to position ourselves very uniquely in, in BC um, just through leveraging what we can do in terms of BIM and uh, fabrication. Um, obviously, we have to execute on the site and our general contractors understand that, but it, it's definitely been a big, a big feature of us seeing the growth that we have. Um, currently have the, the largest workbook we, we've ever had on the company, so that, that's fantastic for us. Um, the other thing I'll say is the BIM and the, the prefab has definitely driven us to um, work in nothing but that design assist, design build project, uh, which right. is obviously beneficial for everybody involved. Um, and our local developers and our general contractors, you know, they, they keep coming back to us and asking for the same again, right? So it's right. fill that design build role, fill that design assist role, work with us early. Um, we're being kind of directly spoken to before there's even a hole in the ground, coming to the table, presenting what we want to offer, yeah. um, and then leveraging that design assist role to make sure that we can approach the project how we want to approach the project. Um, obviously right on. that. So it's a, yeah, lot no, more, a lot more collaborative and yeah. yeah yeah and obviously that that really helps with the sites as well you know we're, we're drastically reducing the manpower required on the site um reducing that manpower stacking because we're leveraging that prefabrication on the front end so yeah it's been a it's been a good growth period for us and definitely enjoying working on these big complicated projects for bc yeah really interesting it's uh it sounds like it's really this whole initiative has really transformed the way your business operates and how and how you win work. Um, and, it, and it sounds like you haven't done a lot of lump sum work recently, but um, do you have perspective on trying to get this approach off the ground in a lump sum environment? Is it, is it more difficult? Is it, is it even possible without the early collaboration? Um, I would say it's possible. Um, the thing that we've seen over the last few years is you have to work through those standards of prefabrication. So as long as you build those standards around the kind of work that you're bidding and you understand that um, you can leverage that manufacturing environment and that improved quality, 
um, early enough and then apply those standards to each project. So I, I think it can work in, in a big a bid spec world. Um, it's just nice being able to leverage that and say, actually, no, this is the way we're going to going to execute this work on that design assist side just to be able to truly leverage the most optimal way rather than changing the goalposts each time depending right on. on what the spec says so pit meadows has set up some pretty advanced supply chain tracking technology are you leveraging data in real time are you now able to measure um measure better understand your productivity rates understand the activities on the job site in a more precise way and how are you leveraging that uh, that da that data going forward? Is that informing how you estimate projects? Yeah, it's certainly becoming more and more prevalent. I, I actually think that's probably the next um, the next major piece of the puzzle for us is making sure we leverage that data as much as we can. Um, we're definitely leveraging it on the fabrication side. Um, so the way that our software works, we're actually able to see in real time our productivity inside of the shop. Um, we live track every single spool or assembly that we're making through the shop through tracking status in the background, which are, are linked to QR codes for each assembly. Um, so we use that to drive our manpower requirements in the shop, who's working where for the day, what welders are working on, what orders. Um, and it really does give us a, a much more in-depth overview of, of what's actually happening with our workforce every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we're, we're starting to expand that onto the construction sites too. So uh, the platform that we use is capable of also doing site tracking. Um, so we're starting to get to the point now where uh, the, the field foremen are actually updating the, the tracking statuses, uh, depending on their progress up, up a residential tower, for example, you know, we're, we're tracking, has this pipe been craned onto the uh, floor that it's required on? Has it been installed? Has it been pressure tested? Has it been insulated? has the general contractor then signed off on that. Um, so yeah, it's becoming more and more crucial to us to have that data in real time, um, just to truly understand what we're, yeah, cool. what we're doing every day. So what advancements are you targeting to introduce over the next couple of years? Um, again, it, it's that data piece for me. So we've worked quite thoroughly through the automation of, of different processes. Um, we have quite a wide range of, of automated machinery now, which is actually tying directly in with, with our software, which ties it directly to our BIM model. Um, so we've sort of worked through that process. We're getting to the point now where that's working very well for us and we're actually able to leverage those advantages. But with that, we're producing a ton of data um, and that data is allowing us to, to better plan our day. Um, so I see the automation of the use of that data being our next main challenge to overcome. Um, I'd love to get to a point where as we innovate and as AI becomes more prevalent in the industry, it starts to tell us what to do, right? I'd love to get to a point where it's like, okay, stop, stop cutting that order right now. The welders up here haven't quite finished what they're doing. Um, you know, or even right down to the point of give this welder this, this pack because he's able to produce faster than uh, this welder in this booth or it's a different type of work. Um, that's definitely what I see us targeting in the next few years is just that true automation piece, getting towards like a, a, a true manufacturing mindset, you know, that, yeah. that Toyota model of understanding your tack times for absolutely everything and refining that process down to truly understand what you're producing. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Uh... Sam Revel is one of the uh, leading industry, industry experts in automation and fabrication in the mechanical space and Pitt Meadows is, is really an amazing uh, supplier out in, in British Columbia. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today and thank you so much for the contribution to our publication and hope to yeah. see you in person soon. Great, thanks a lot, Tom. Thanks. Glad to be involved. So that brings us to the end of our event. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors that uh, made this possible. Of course, thank you to Sarah and everyone who participated in pulling together the Innovation Spotlight this year. Extremely proud of it. Go online, order a copy, get it to your doorstep. In fact, order a couple, give it to your boss, give it to some other people. Uh, we really want to grow this organization. We feel that the more innovators that we have at the table, the better. Let's, let's all work to make this the place where we gather and talk about improving the industry. I think we've got a long way to go. I'm very excited about the future. 
I'm very excited about the innovation that's happening across the country. And uh, I'm excited for our, our next event. So tune in on May 14th.